So good morning again. Um, thank you for spending your Wednesdays with the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. My name is Lilia McEnany and I am an assistant curator at MIAC. And as you all know, we're here today to chat with the completely fabulous Raphael Begay. So a few things before we get started. Um, to begin, I would like to briefly acknowledge the place where this conversation is happening, even though, even though we aren't physically at the museum today, um, in Ogopoga within the Tewa world. As a non-Native person living in so-called Santa Fe, I am a guest in the ancestral homelands of the Tewa people, and I wish to acknowledge all of the Indigenous folks, Pueblo, Diné, Apache, and so many others, past, present, and future, who walk on these lands and steward these places. And I would encourage everybody watching here today to reflect on the land on which they reside and occupy. Um, so for those of you who do not know, the Goodman Aspiring Artist Fellowship was established at MIAC by Dr. and Mrs. Connie Goodman, who are wonderful members, friends, and supporters of the museum. The fellowship is designed to provide financial assistance to up and coming Native artists who show promise and are eager to move to the next level of their development. Goodman fellowships have often opened doors to other opportunities for recipients, such as artist residencies at the School for Advanced Research or the Santa Fe Art Institute, invitations to markets, as well as gallery and museum exhibitions. So this program with Raphael is the eighth in our series um, highlighting our Goodman Fellows. So recordings of each of these events are available on our YouTube page. Um, and these conversations will continue over the next few months, um, generally on the fourth, fourth Wednesday of the month at 10 a.m. So keep an eye out on uh, MIAC's social media newsletter for future dates and um, information on uh, future presentations from our fellows. So Raphael Begay is a visual storyteller who aims to culturally express and creatively advocate for understanding and teaching found within the Diné way of life. Named one of the 12 New Mexico artists to know in 2020 by Southwest Contemporary, he is also the recipient of the 2021-2022 Goodman Aspiring Artist Fellowship and current research associate at MIAC. In 2017, he obtained his BFA in photography with a minor in arts management and an undergraduate certificate in museum studies from UNM. So with that, I will hand it over to Raphael. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Yate, she'e Raphael bige yinishe, anaafi nishle, kifle chitni bashishchin, taban dashiche, ado washin dashimele, sinishchi e chishike ado seo hotanet nasha. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ralphie Albigay, and um, thank you all for joining us this morning, and welcome. I'm just going to go ahead and go into sharing my screen. Fabulous. And so uh, for my presentation today, I wanted to focus on my journey as a storyteller, as um, Lilia had mentioned, and reference not only land acknowledgement, but the uh, life ways and experiences and memories that come from it, and my personal relationship um, to my surroundings, as well as my origin and what I hope to carry on forward as a steward within my life. So again, as an introduction, um, I am uh, one who walks around, Hana uh, Ahni, born for Red House, Kitla uh, My paternal grandparents is Water's Edge or Tabahe, and my paternal grandparents are Salt or Ashihe. Uh, I was born and raised in Huntress Point, Arizona, uh, it's just about maybe 15 minutes south of Render Rock, Arizona. Um, and this particular place is one where I began my journey with a sense of curiosity, a sense of wonder and um, amazement with my surroundings, surrounded by mountains, trees, red rock. Um, this is a photograph taken by Evan Benali Atwood. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting them through a colleague of mine, Nate LaMalle, based in Albuquerque. And they are creating a series on indigenous queer joy. And I thought I'd share this photograph to give you uh, some context in terms of where I'm from and the place that I inhabit as a individual, as Diné. Uh, this photograph here and as um, is entitled Navel, taken in Hunters Point, Arizona. This is my grandparents' sheep corral. Um, I am named after my grandfather, Rafael Tabaha and my grandmother, Marie Tabaha. Um, within this place, I uh, return to, it is a source of inspiration and strength for me, but it is also my place of origin. My mother tells this uh, funny story or this amazing story actually of the uh, bearing of my umbilical cord within the sheep corral. Within Navajo folklore, this is a space or a place that you shall return to throughout your life. And I find myself 
throughout my creative journey as, as an individual, um, as a collaborator, as a storyteller, uh, coming home more often uh, to reflect and to think and to reference back my, my upbringing and my sense of origin and my beliefs that come from this place. In a similar way as we're sharing space and uh, occupying um, this virtual space, uh, I wanted to channel this sense of uh, beginnings as well as this sense of honoring and recognition of where um, these ideas came from. So again, um, in 2017, I received my BFA from the University of New Mexico and returned back to the Navajo Nation and started my series of vernacular response which is what I like to describe as the uh, documentation of the cultural landscape found within the Navajo Nation, uh, primarily uh, surrounding ideas of home and uh, our social ecology and relationship to sheep and our surroundings in the landscape. This photograph here on the left is called Res Dog. And I find it quite striking, but for me to capture this moment at the time, it was a very serendipitous happening. It was just, um, after a sheep butchering in celebration of some sort of family event, I don't necessarily recall. But as I was documenting uh, this moment with the dog, I noticed that um, his, he was so fearful and possessive and defensive of what he had, which in this case is a sheep head. Uh, what you can't necessarily tell here to the left is another dog uh, eyeing that particular sheep head. And there's this interesting contrast happening of fear and and, and anger and the sense of survival and desperation happening. And I thought it was um, uh, fascinating to think about our relationships um, and the space that we co-inhabit, but also the process of life and how it continues to transform, develop and change. I believe that is the only constant within the world. And as I was spending my time home, I really wanted to um, push my ideas and my creativity as well as my act of reflecting within my practice to a new to a new level to a new awareness um, with that came looking at the more intimate and everyday moments of life found on the reservation to the right is a photograph titled internal uh, this is the inner lining of a sheepskin drying in the sun on the table uh, speaking of balance and contrast um, something that sticks out to me here is the wool fibers and the um, but sort of the flesh and muscle and, and, and uh, remnants of this disconnection to body that is referenced on the sheepskin itself. From this point of view, it looks like, uh, you know, aerial photography of the landscape, this living being. And I think um, the two photographs side to side reference this uh, notion of life and this continuum. And while home, um, also referencing these everyday moments, I began to really explore my surroundings and return to places that I recall as a child that offer great hope, uh, great joy, places that I escaped to, to think and to reflect and to plan what I wanted for my future. Just down the road at Huntress Point, uh, there is this particular wash. And uh, I recall in the summers coming down here for uh, nada or ceremony, and seeing um, the water rushing. And when I was back home on the reservation and traveling around and trying to find different points of view and being reminded of the beauty within the landscape, I would come across what I like to think are visual blessings. Visual blessings to me are these moments of time and space within the landscape that are offered to you if you're willing to receive, if you are aware. Um, one thing I like to reference within my work is that I am not seeking a image. I am not trying to create an idea through photography. I am simply responding. Um, hence the uh, title of my series of vernacular response, which I believe is now transitioning into a the theoretical framework that I can use to navigate and create and preserve these stories that I come in contact with. Or in this case, one simple moment. And this image is called Frozen. And while home, I've had the opportunity to really expand my sense of what that actually is, from being based in Hunter's Point to moving to Render Rock, Arizona when I was younger, and then transitioning to um, Gallup and then Albuquerque to pursue my education and now returning. 
I soon became aware of the significance and unique energy and livelihood and sense of being that comes from the reservation. Uh, this photograph entitled Field is taken in Monument Valley in January 2018. And it's an interesting story. And I, I think these images have the power to uh, hold these memories, hold these understandings and these reflections. Uh, and in a similar fashion, I'm able to activate them and share them with you in reference to my own understanding and interpretation. Um, but referencing back again, this memory, uh, this was my first time visiting Monument Valley and it just happened to be covered in snow and fog. But I don't necessarily recall seeing many images of Monument Valley in the snow at this time of year. And I'm aware of the iconic imagery throughout uh, film, media, tourism imagery. But to be here and this be my first um, interaction, I thought was truly a blessing and the power of the imagination to fill in the gaps as it were, but also this interesting moment that exists between the, the sky and the earth and on the horizon. And as I began to venture out into the reservation, I sought out um, creative acts or indigenous imagination as revolution. Um, I wanted to document individuals or communities activating their own space, using their own creativity and projecting their own ideas into the world. This is taken in outside of Mexican water in Arizona, again, just um, northeast of Monument Valley. And I spent a lot of time on the Western Agency part of the Navajo Nation during this period. Um, my former partner lived in the area and I had the opportunity to see the reservation from a different perspective but also from an intimate point of view that was very personal and um, sacred to me. Uh, this particular photograph entitled Emergence references the emergence of life and the cyclical um, perspective that we as Navajo have as the net. Um, pictured here on this abandoned satellite is a motif or some sort of gorilla um, rendering of a Navajo basket. And as you're driving along the highway there, you can see it glistening and it has a certain energy radiating from it. Uh, but in the back, you also have these power lines and the single isolated home. On the rock there, it says, do not litter. And something about these moments within my exploration or at least my expansion within the reservation allowed me to recognize the value of these small acts of kindness, acts of creativity but also um, the sense of preservation of, of imagery or visual culture of memory that um, each individual can uh, engage with when they see not only this image, but this particular object in mind. And as I continue to travel, and um, one of the primary reasons to moving back to the reservation was I accepted a job with the Navajo Nation tribal government with the Division of Human Resources. And it began as a temporary position and they soon became regular status as a public information officer. And through this process, I began to see the reservation on an, on an even extensive level and began to travel more. And it was at this time that I lost my Nelly lady. And my father's mother was, um, her particular home is in Coyote Canyon. And this is where this image is taken. It's called Red House Views or referencing my second clan, Kefla Um, There in the distance is the mountain just beneath, uh, or at the base is Tohatchi. Um, and that is the beginning of the Chusco Range Mountains here in New Mexico. But referencing back my home lineage and origin and sense of being as related to my clans or, or in just in my family history, I wanted to think of home as energy, as existence and not necessarily be bound or divided by border state line on off the reservation. Although we may communicate in that way, I think um, something within my journey as an artist, as a creator, as a, as a observer is trying to challenge that and trying to find new ways to think of home, to reference the reservation, not only as home um, and you know, bound by its own reservation borders, but 
the sense of an expansive idea that can exist even now in virtual space and is right in front of you, wherever you may be. And again, moving forward, this uh, photograph is entitled Manuelito, and this is taken in La Cochica, Arizona. And again, being able to travel, I took this photograph just after a chapter meeting uh, while employed with the Navajo Nation. And something fascinating that I've come to find is that um, Navajo youth or, or just even the community have this innate and inherent uh, creativity within them. I truly believe that uh, we as Diné, as indigenous individuals are inherently blessed with that. Uh, we are able to create and use our imagination to activate our realities. Not to say that it's particular to us, but it is something that um, I think is paramount within our community. And this particular image referencing the graffiti of Manuelito uh, in the center in Barbacito on the left, LA referencing this idea of Los Angeles, but on the reservation is Lakachibe. This regional knowledge and this sense of um, uh, cultural history, being a sense of pride in a, on a building that is maybe desolate uh, with a backdrop that is so epic. I find these contrasts of ideas and these indigenous aesthetics related to place as well as my own interpretation and journey to be um, truly inspiring. And that is what has continued my practice as a photographer while being employed with the Navajo Nation. It's expanded upon this. Uh, within that, I've had the opportunity now to attend parades um, in support of the Navajo Nation Band, uh, the uh, Navajo Nation Ambassadors that was established in the early 20s. And to meet these members and to hear their stories as to why they can still continue to participate and the amount of joy and hope that it brings to the community, this sense of uh, representation of our, our being an ambassador, not only as being a part of an entity, but as an individual, as the net, as just a citizen, as an artist, how do I utilize my role and my capabilities and my skills to aid in the celebration of my people, in the celebration of the ideas and stories that they share with me and, uh, and I have the pleasure of documenting. I think this is currently where I am trying to combine uh, my different facets of life into my creative life, which again, I don't see as separate. Um, I don't view um, my art as separate from me. I believe it is my life. And there is a creatively, there's a creative existence in which I identify within the world. And that's how I relate to my surroundings. And as I began to think more about this in reference to my photographic practice, um, I also think about the timeliness of these ideas. Um, you know, uh, in 2018, when I first returned back to the Navajo Nation was the 150th anniversary of the signing of the, Nav of the Treaty of 1868 with, between the United States and the, Diné, the Navajo Nation. And our release from Bosque Redondo and return to our homelands within the Four Corners region. And at this time and throughout, the, uh, throughout my tenure with the Navajo Nation government, these themes of cultural preservation, of cultural pride, of exhibiting these beautiful ideas that, are, that come from our stories that are within our surroundings, within the land, the things we plant and build and grow as um, symbols of hope, symbols of change, symbols of time immemorial. I think this is really beautiful. And one thing that definitely comes to mind are these parades that I've had the pleasure of walking in and documenting. This was taken um, in 2019 at the Central Agency Parade in Chinle, Arizona, a parade I've never been to because it's not my local community. But as a visitor, I just got to see the amazing creative quality that exists within the reservation and our people. Um, but from that perspective came um, engaging within these political gatherings. This is taken at the closing of the Navajo Generating Station this huge power plant located um, outside Page, Arizona. Uh, this idea of extraction and sovereignty and these different ideas of how to uh, provide economy as well as a sense of political power within the world. I have an insider perspective to these things and 
I'm currently working on ways to share that, but I just thought I'd offer these views from for this per, uh, presentation. But also within my role now, trying to combine my creativity and these reflections and ideas as a creative, and we had that opportunity to collaboratively develop a float for the Western Navajo Nation Agency Fair in Chuba City, Arizona. Again, my second time to even the location, I had the opportunity to bring something. My boss wanted to just throw an emoji on a, um, you know, on a float and call it a day. And I thought, well, let's let's res it up a bit. Let's make it Diné. The theme for this particular um, parade and fair was living my best res life. And so we created, we gave him a hat with some uh, aluminum foil, paper plate, concho, silver belts with a painted on leather brown band uh, with a CA, the Navajo hair bun that was tied with some string there. But within human resources, we wanted to reference the role of customer service. Uh, and I think something within Navajo mannerisms is our way of introduction and relating to one another through care. Um, through this process of working within the Navajo Nation as well as within my community, I'm now focused on community, not audience within my work. I'm not necessarily trying to um, expand my audience, but I am trying to honor my community and have their stories be uplifted through the image, images and the way that I share that work in the same way that a float can offer that and be a mobile exhibition of ideas within a space, within a moment, within theme. And as I began to look at parades and, and these social gatherings as forms of exhibition, um, I believe, again, I reference back to the ideas of pride, a sense of sovereignty, um, origin and history. Uh, this was taken at the Navajo Code Talkers Day Parade in Render Rock, Arizona, and this ongoing um, recognition of the sacrifices of our ancestors and those who have came before. And there's this mantra that we are our ancestors while the streams, we are their prayers. And I truly believe that and I try and respect that with the work that I do and what I'm able to document and share as opposed to just, you know, clicking my shutter speed at everything that looks say pretty or photogenic. And transitioning into 2020, um, this is taken at Ojo Encino Chapter House in the eastern part of the reservation on Navajo. And it was at a time when my journey started was in response to Dakota Access Pipeline and other social and environmental justice movements. Um, back in 2016, I was challenged to document what was really important to me, what was of value, what I thought could teach and share. And I always find that to be a beautiful perspective to have anytime you're just engaging with your surroundings and going about your day-to-day -day life. Um, you were offered these lessons, you were offered these moments to reflect and stop and think. And I think um, within my work and within my life, I've had that opportunity to respond in that way. And as the pandemic moved in and we had to really go virtual and and think about our what really was of value to us. I, in a similar fashion to how I began my series, I returned home. I mean, we couldn't really go anywhere. We we're all quarantining and isolating at the time. And I really wanted to um, think about my own personal space. And this was a, a photograph called Bluebird Backyard. And this was included in the show at Dine Dink uh, within Gallup, New Mexico. But these intimate everyday moments that offer a sense of hope, a sense of um, imagination, but just really the beauty and joy that can be found in your own backyard is something that I think is possible for everyone. Uh, it's even outside our windows right now. And as I continued moving throughout the year, I had the opportunity to start to reflect on leadership and what it means to collaborate uh, with a community-oriented focus, knowing that that's where a majority of my time has been lately is walking and hiking and thinking, feeling uh, these small acts of existence that we take for granted, I think have true power. Uh, referencing back my introduction and who I am as a Dene male, um, I am Hanaafni, one who walks around. And that is exactly what I do with my camera. Again, I am responding to my environment 
I am responding to this particular moment in my thoughts and able to reference back to um, that particular moment in time that offers, again, strength similar to returning back to the corral. I'm finding other places, other experiences similar to that through the documentation of these moments, through the documentation of different parts of the reservation. This is taken in lower wheat bills um, in Salie, Arizona. And this is where my boss's homestead is at. Uh, her name is Dr. Perfilia Fowler, and she's really have, has been a mentor for me since being back and thinking about the role that each of us can play in response to a pandemic, in response to the need of the community. Um, I think it's a, a very important time to reference those skills and abilities you have and how you can activate them to help others. And in a small way, I, I imagine my photographs can offer that. And I'm ever since um, this year, this pandemic has began, it's really thinking about what I can do with my work, how I can choose to exhibit it and use it as a means to gather thought, memory, and allow for a moment of understanding, if not a moment of reflection and appreciation. And again, being able to travel, but also seeing space and places. Um, before the pandemic, my work was primarily of, of, of cultural landscapes void of human bodies. I do not believe there are void of human presence. Uh, but as I started to move into the government and get comfortable with taking photographs of these political gatherings and events, they stopped. And I had to question, um, what is it that I'm trying to document and what is it that I am seeing? And at the time on the reservation, there were a lot of these handmade signs and people using their creativity and imagination to create PSAs, to create stay home signs, be safe and really trying to hold the community accountable because we cared for one another. And I remember going for a drive one day, and I just thought, you know, I'm just gonna keep driving until I feel that I need to get back before the sun sets, you know, it is winter. And I was driving and I, I've always been an admirer of lights, especially during Christmas. I don't consider myself religious at all, spiritual. For the most part, but there's something about the lights and the decorations and this idea of reverence that has always stuck with me. I'm born in December and the winter has a very uh, beautiful time of um, the beautiful energy that helps me refresh. And it's usually when I like to reflect on my year or at least the year to come. And this was taken at the end of the first year in 2020 in December. And I thought this was really beautiful as I was driving, it caught my attention and I stopped. And, you know, it is not anything grand, but just the gesture alone uh, is echoes the similar sentiment of holding open the door for someone, uh, willing to listen to someone and be present and hear their, hear their story, hear their journey, offer some advice. I think these interactions are becoming limited with the virtual world that we're becoming accustomed to or at least the so way that we engage with social media and are more concerned with our online existence. Probably the younger generation more than the, um, the older generation for sure. But this is, um, I thought something as simple as a few tinsel and some a beautiful backdrop of the natural landscape would offer uh, this moment to honor and respect yourself. And by way of that, being able to honor and respect others. That is where community is born. That's, those are the values that you can find from it. And moving into 2021, reflecting back in my journey, uh, it is something that I continue to do. And I don't mean to sound self-absorbed or you know anything like that. It is merely my own understanding and how I um, exist within the world. It is what I know the most, what is what I know best. And I believe it is my truth. I believe it is my strength. I believe it is literally the way I see the world. And um, I'd like to take a moment now to just acknowledge um, the, the Goodmans and the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, to all the collaborators and friends that I have the joy of um, experiencing life with and taking along on my journey and me joining them on theirs. 
And throughout the fellowship, um, I've had the opportunity to really take time to enjoy my walks in my everyday life and uh, just, um, I, I guess, be absorbed in my ideas and of, of about home. And, and within that, I had the opportunity to collaborate with uh, Hadley Jensen and we developed this project um, and I joined them on this initiative to document the Navajo Nation from a new perspective, from an immersive, from an extensive perspective with respect to regional uh, land-based knowledge, um, with respect to Navajo ecological knowledge. And um, within that, this is a photograph of the Vrinda Rock overlooking the central part of the government. And my office is just located there on the left. <laughs> but it is this particular window within the Rindarok. It's a place that I return to um, within the distance there at the base of the horizon. Uh, you can, that's where Hunter's Point is. And this particular view offers me a way to see where I am located, where both my, of my homes are located. And this idea of centralization versus regionalization is something that is an ongoing discussion within Navajo politics, um, within Navajo relationships, within the reservation. But with respect to that and ownership of that, uh, this particular project this past year allowed us to see the reservation from a different perspective using a 360 camera. Um, but as a support to that, I took images along the way that offered a more intimate and a, a personal perspective. And I thought I'd share those with with you today. Uh, this is looking beneath the render rock directly above you. And so you have the opportunity to stand above or stand on top of the actual rock formation, the window formation and overlook the, the part of render rock. But very rarely do I see images of the actual bridge itself underneath. And I, I believe the composition is similar to that found in a rainbow. And a lot of my work lately has been dealing with light, the balance between you know, light and shadow, but also how light plays a key role within Navajo culture, referencing the four sacred colors of the white light rising in the east, um, blue within the sky, yellow with the setting sun in the west, and black in the night sky within the north. And being able to tell time and reference space and your own existence and feel the heat, the light, sun, and the wind. Um, this is something that we're trying to replicate in terms of activating and immersing the individual viewer with that relationship to this particular moment. The photograph here on the left um, is a, an image of the sagebrush and the photograph on the right is my grandmother's sheep corral referencing back navel, the first photograph that I showed where my journey began as a photographer. And again, a lot of these ideas are cyclical. They are ever self-revolving and I'm able to choose and activate them. Um, and I, these are part of the images that will be featured within this project. And so from Render Rock, we went south to Hunter's Point and then further south to Lupton and then to Chinle, Arizona. This particular photograph is in Canyon de Chez, and this rock formation is Spider Rock. And this particular project that I'm referencing uh, was is in support of an upcoming exhibition uh, that Hadley's curating, and I've had the pleasure to contribute to. But uh, we were focusing on the agencies within the Navajo Nation as well as these. Uh, sites of interest, sacred sites, uh, tourism sites, renowned sites, well-known sites, but places that have origin and significance to the Denev within each particular region, but also have a connection to trade, to craft, to story, to relationship, to understanding, uh, in a similar way to the people and the plants and the animals that occupy the space, we had the pleasure to take a, again, a 360 camera and document these um, locations. Uh, and this is that particular camera here. 
and it was pretty fascinating. Um, we, I, I won't say too much here, but um, keep an eye out for some upcoming projects and, and um, programming related to the imagery and the work that we were able to uh, create through this process and journey. But in a similar fashion to moving clockwise in the Hogan, uh, we moved in a roughly clockwise fashion throughout the reservation. Uh, this is here, this is taken here in Monument Valley. And it was an opportunity for us to expand the ideas and views of, again, these renowned places that I'm sure many people think they have an understanding of. Uh, it only takes a step or a slight shift in your perspective to see the world from a new point of view. And I believe this camera offered a <laughs> definitely an immersive view, but also these intimate moments that, uh, again, continue to pass us by. I think one thing that I really enjoy as a storyteller, as an image maker, is documenting these fleeting moments that only are going to happen once that you can't necessarily return to and take again. And again, I reference these as visual blessings to the left here as we were about our trip in Monument Valley and Eagle was flying about us. And lo and behold, that is where we stopped and the view there was really fantastic. Uh, to the image on the right is some weeds taken on the landscape within the park. But the sense of balance and radiance and energy that exists within the imagery is something that I'm very particularly interested in, especially as I'm moving forward within my work, trying to really be present while I'm documenting and responding to my surroundings. Again, this photograph is in Monument Valley, taking up the, all the different buttes. Something within my work I like to reference within my journey is I am within a place between red dirt and blue skies. And similar to the three color, base three colors within the Navajo rainbow, of the, the rainbow within the Navajo Nation seal, red, yellow, and blue, I look at the land as, again, red, the blue as the sky, and the yellow, which I believe is the light existing within the world that creates the rainbow. In a similar fashion, uh, the horizon line throughout my work plays a key role in the relationships that we have and the balance that is our existence between these two places, these two spaces, these two senses of being. I believe that we are the light within the world and trying to translate that and incorporate it into my photography is something I'm hoping to do as I move forward within my practice. And as we were ending our journey, uh, we ventured into the Northern part of the reservation to Shiprock. And um, this particular region, similar to that of um, Denahotso and the Western Agency, Shiprock um, also plays an intimate and personal role in my life. And to be able to see this part of the reservation and meet the amazing community members along the way is truly a blessing. And I always reference Shiprock as a stronghold. Uh, they have a Northern Agency fair that is referenced as the most traditional fair and references the Yebiche. And it just so happened at the time with respect to COVID as we were traveling through, that is when that particular fair would have happened. But here, um, taking different vantage points of this rock formation and referencing that stronghold. Uh, there's a different point of view that is offered each single time, as well as a different experience in a similar way, each step throughout your walk and throughout the day can really inform and inspire the way you go about your life. And again, these are some details from this particular site visit here on the left. There's some, um, what they would call the wings of the rock. Uh, um, and the Navajo translation for ship rock is the rock with wings and these sort of like buttresses coming out of the ground reference those elongated wings. But here on the right, um, I included this image because it shows um, the relationship, the subtle textures and um, sort of harmonious um, blending of these colors and, and it just seems to vibrate. I think something very intimate exists within these images and I hope to expand upon that as I pay more attention to detail and these everyday moments when we can so easily document them with our phones and post them. Um, I, I'm trying now to be to have a bit more intent with the work that I'm documenting and not necessarily taking but allowing the land the landscape and these images to radiate with their own source of energy. 
and lessons and teachings and understanding. And at the base of the ship rock, you come to view this substantial presence, this substantial moment, and, and you're able to have this somatic, symbiotic relationship with a rock formation um, that has stood the test of time, that has seen the world changed and shift and moved. And it was at the end of this particular journey that I offered a prayer and, and said thanks for our safety, for those who crossed our path and offered stories and shared um, their perspective because it informs ours in the same way that I hope that the images I'm sharing today uh, have added some point of view to your perspective, whether that's today or of the reservation or photography. Um, I think a, a different view just offers that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Raphael, for that really spectacular um, conversation about your work. There are so many things that I want to ask you about. Again, thank you um, for such a wonderful presentation. I really always enjoy hearing you talk about the concept of visual blessings, as well as your approach to audience versus community um, in collaboration and um, these ideas of embodied landscapes. And so while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I would like to focus a little bit more on your concept of visual blessings. And I think it would be wonderful if you can to talk a little bit more about how you came to that um, kind of framework for thinking about your work and your practice. Sure, sure. So it actually came to me while I was visiting New Zealand. So I had an opportunity with the amazing support of Dr. Danette Dell and Jennifer, uh, I'm sorry, um, Deborah Romanak and Will Wilson to uh, participate in a panel discussion at uh, the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, NASA, at their conference. And uh, an attendee to our presentation asked um, uh, a question about the significance or at least how I was responding in creating this work. And I just said, well, I, I really view it as a visual blessing. And it was the first time I actually thought of it in that way. And it was truly uh, an, an aha moment, an epiphany. But leading up to that, uh, you know, I look at everything as an opportunity for, as challenge and opportunity as a way to develop and expand my way of thinking and being um, easier said than done, of course. But as I walk around with my camera, I see things, or at least I'm able to stop and appreciate things that I believe represent an idea or a memory that I can um, ascribe to it. I think one thing as, as artists we need to remember is that we ascribe value, we give value. We have that power. In the same way, land can offer that value back to us. Our surroundings can offer that back to us. Um, I think that is the power within photography. I mean, for example, all these images framed on my wall um, harken back to a particular memory, but I view them as blessings because they teach, because I'm able to feel um, I'm blessed with memories back to my childhood and uh, the stories of my grandparents and the way that they embodied land and how they learned from it, how they respected livestock and their surroundings. And there is a certain aesthetic to it on the reservation that I believe is powerful. And I believe my community members at times tend to forget that. And so to reference it as a visual blessing, as an everyday experience, as a vernacular response, I believe these are the same things. But while I was in New Zealand, um, I was definitely met with challenges and a different perspective. But I also was relating back to my home and how beautiful this place really was and how it reminded me of that sense of relationship to the Southwest. And that's how it came about. Wonderful. Um, that's really interesting how you just kind of, it kind of came to you. You were explaining your work and the phrase just kind of came out of you. That's fantastic. Um, so uh, we have a comment from our interim executive director, uh, Dr. Matthew Martinez saying, I so appreciate your attention to indigenous aesthetics and Diné sensibilities. Your contributions to the seen and unseen are impactful. And I would have to agree with that. So thank you again, Raphael. 
um, for sharing your insights with us. Um, we have a question from Dr. Hadley Jensen um, saying, thank you, Raphael, for the fantastic talk. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how the 360 Project foregrounds reciprocity efforts, the ways we might make this documentation accessible and relevant to the Navajo Nation in addition to the general public. Sure, and hi, Hadley, thanks for coming. And throughout the process of our trip, um, Hadley and I were having discussions about how this can exist on the reservation. I, one thing that I remember throughout our journey was being so uh, excited to see the imagery, which in itself is truly phenomenal, but also the perspective it offers for visitors, people who can't necessarily um, be in that particular location on the reservation but also for community members who have not seen their own reservation similar to me. It took um, work within the tribal governments and a relationship to get me out of Render Rock. <laughs> but in reference to the work and the imagery within it, and we're hoping to share it with tribal entities uh, within the government, such as the Navajo Nation Tourism Department, Navajo Nation Parks and Recreation. Again, out of these particular sites, we visited three tribal parks, Render Rock, Canyon de Chez, and Monument Valley, Ship Rock being its own, its own location. But trying to offer a different perspective to those who think they understand it. I think these particular places are thought of and referenced in movies and, and tourist photos. I think there's an opportunity to have children see the world from a different perspective, particularly Spider Rock in reference to stories of spider woman and how the Navajo were taught um, Navajo weaving. A perfect time to reference that with winter storytelling programming. Um, in addition to that, trying to incorporate these perspectives with regional knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge uh, back to Navajo dye plants, medicinal plants. And so those are some ideas that we're vibrating with and also incorporating it into exhibitions related to textile production and and patronage, but also referencing landscape and vernacular and cultural landscape photography. I think there is untapped potential, just even with that particular camera and view, but also with the many discussions surrounding it. Absolutely, and I think that speaks really well to um, a point you made earlier in the conversation about your distinction between audience versus community and fostering community through your work rather than um, trying to cater to or serve a particular audience. Um, and I think that ties in really well to a question that we have from Abigail, who is asking about um, exhibitions and gallery spaces. And um, she is asking, how do you view exhibition, exhibitioning in a gallery space? Meaning what do these movements hold for you in contrast or in conjunction with your revealing, reflecting, or simply responding to what you see, discover, or perceive? I think, um... Well, the first major gallery exhibition that I had was at the UNM Museum of Anthropology, thanks to Deborah uh, Romanek. But I, re I remember it was my first time really having to think about it outside of you know, education. And I thought about the aesthetics of Navajo white. So there's the white cube aesthetic and something I'm interested in is in developing a Navajo white aesthetic, cube aesthetic, so to speak. Um, I live in Navajo Housing Authority uh, in Ixche, and so their walls are painted with Navajo white, which can be seen in my little video here. But as I was referencing back these, the curation and the installation of, the, of my work, I, I knew that I was talking about home and I knew that I wanted it to be personal. And for those individuals, such as my community, who may feel out of place when entering a gallery, I wanted them to feel comfortable. I literally wanted them to feel at home. And so I thought that was an interesting idea to combine that understanding, those relational and indigenous aesthetics to communicate a sense of belonging, not only representative within the work, but also within the space. In a similar fashion, I had the opportunity to exhibit my work at the Loom Indigenous Art Gallery in Gallup, New Mexico, where it was surrounded by pawn shops, liquor stores, and, and, and loan places. And there's a very uh, border town aesthetic and extractive nature to the economy there. 
And I thought, well, I'm well aware of this particular place and I want to bring this light, this energy that is within my work and my perspective. And I thought I was offering something to the art community or to the people, to the tourists, but the people who really responded were our unsheltered relatives who were just passing by. And as I was installing the work and I was returning back and removing things and changing it around, I wanted it to live. I wanted it to move and breathe. They stopped and made a point to offer their appreciation for being reminded of home, being reminded of the beauty that was there and that it was always there and they could just go home to that. And it was truly, I don't know, it was really moving that I could do that with my work. So moving forward, trying to incorporate this intimate perspective in relationship to these community oriented symbolism or imagery or landscape photography and use my personal perspective as a storyteller to activate space. Um, we have a, um, some projects and exhibitions coming up um, in collaboration with Hadley, with Lilia um, that will come down the pipe as it were. But we're in conversation now to really have a diverse and an inclusive perspective and a collaborative approach to developing exhibitions and being able to have those conversations regarding what we think is uh, visually appealing, but also what can offer a sense of change. And I view it as a form of gathering in the same way that we gather as community and in the same way that we gather within our homes and we gather these ideas and memories. I believe the exhibition has the same way and it's it in, and it's its own art form. Absolutely. And I um I love the idea of kind of imbuing museum spaces that are often so sterile and impersonal um historically um with intimate perspectives to kind of activate them as you say. And I do think that's something that um we are going to be talking a lot more about. Um, we're not gonna talk about it too much here, but um, Dr. Jensen Raphael, and Raphael are co-curating an exhibition for MIAC that is opening um, in July of 2023 that is entitled Horizons, Weaving Between the Lines with Danae Textiles. So you will be hearing a lot more from Raphael um, in the coming years. Um, and we're, we're really excited to be able to engage with your, really unique um, and profound perspectives on all of these different mediums. So we have a lo lot of more questions um, that I don't know if we're gonna have time to get to all of them, but let me see here. Okay, we have a question from, I'm sorry, I'm gonna most likely mispronounce your name, uh, Raishui, um, who says, thank you for your beautiful presentation, Raphael. I found your presentation of landscape as where community exists and people live as one of the characteristics of your work, such as off the office building captured um, within Window Rock. And so can you talk more about that aspect? Because I think that contributes to your non-iconic image. And that actually is one of the similar questions that I wanted to ask you um, about this concept of, you mentioned, that the Navajo Nation is often photographed in this really romantic way where the landscape is um, void of human bodies, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a human presence, I think is how you phrased it. Um, so can you talk more about that and um, your notion of kind of embodied landscapes and how that factors into your work? Sure, um, I reference it as indigenous aesthetics, indigenous to culture, indigenous to land and indigenous to the aesthetic itself. Um, within, uh, we call it res life, right? Reservation-based life. There's certain Navajo humor associated with how we communicate. And that particular understanding, uh, way of seeing or appreciating relating to our surroundings is what I base my work off of. And through that perspective, I'm able to document those moments that I see within the environment, right? And then reference and sort of break down what that symbolism can mean um, for example, uh, the bluebird backyard are all bluebird flower bags, right? And people tend to take those and create aprons out of them, pants and skirts and things like that. But it's sort of this primary source of material, yet they just happen to be hanging on the clothesline drying and create this beautiful pattern. And then you reference back the bluebird, the sense of hope, uh, this visual blessing. I usually feel really lucky, similar to those who may feel that with the hummingbird. I feel that with the bluebird when I see one. 
I feel that it is blessing me or offering me some sort of prayer the same way one were to come across a horn toad or che and be blessed by that. Um, and throughout this process, I think being able to document a human presence is a lot more comfortable to me than the human body because I respect everyone's autonomy and we're all changing and I will look totally different within the next five, ten, 10 minutes, right? As well you. I don't want my imagery to define that. I'd rather it appreciate and document the process of a lived, of a lived experience. I think that's such an interesting point. Um, yeah, and that, that really makes me think about your work in a different way. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we have a question from Fidel Frank. Um, he says, I always love hearing about your origins in Window Rock. I am from Shiprock, which I mostly associate with negativity having grown up here. I appreciate art and do community work to sort through the negatives. I wonder, are there times that you as an artist shed light to the shadows of our communities? Mm. I think Res Dog is probably the image that comes to mind. You know, on the reservation with these stray dogs, you tend to have, um, you can either look away or you can help, right? You can take ownership of your own presence and your own sense of role in the community and help. Um, but we tend to just dismiss them in the same way that we dismiss our unsheltered relatives or those are, who are trying to find their path or who may be lost, however you want to define that. And the way we relate in our communities and our surroundings are our social ecology. I find that fascinating. And the way that I try and shed light on it is through my work by appreciating the smaller things, by really um, putting these res-based aesthetics that may be looked at as dilapidated, as abandoned, as um, a non-Western standard and put it on a pillar and say, this is beauty. Uh, this is what I believe to be of value and this is what it can represent and how it can change and move the world. And being able to do that for not only yourself as an individual, but your surroundings, where you come from, who you are, the, the teachings and your place of origin and what's within your home. I think that has the power to help others. Yeah, and I think that all goes back to the overarching theme within your work of reciprocity and fostering community. Um, and I think that's a beautiful place to kind of wrap up here. I do want to end with one comment from Nana Ba Sam, who says, hi, Raphael. It's always amazing to see you doing good things and sharing your photos with the world. Congratulations on this venture. And again, keep up the amazing work you're doing. Um, I would like to echo that as well. And like I said a few moments ago, for everybody in the audience, we are going to be hearing a lot more from Raphael and um, his collaborators in the coming years as we are working. Um, on an upcoming exhibition together. So thank you, Raphael, for sharing so much about your work as a Goodman Fellow. We're so pleased to be able to collaborate with you in this way. Thank you so much. And thank you for all those attend who attended. Yeah. <laughs>